Hello, you all. Thank y'all for tuning in. I am here with a special guest in honor or in recognition, I guess, of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, if you are new here, my name is Mo James, and I am the founder and chief creativity officer of the Confetti Collective. We inspire women like you to create and live your bold, big, beautiful life. And we're, I wanted to bring you all a real story a real experience uh, because a lot of times when we talk about this awareness month and this awareness month and this campaign and that campaign it's easy to separate ourselves emotionally um, from those things because we don't have a personal connection i wanted you to hear from somebody that has lived through this um, and has come out on the other side we're here today with my special guest Miss Andrea Marie Peter, who I consider, and I have told her this, she is the Iris Apfel of Sierra Vista. <laughs> okay. If you follow fashion, you know who Iris Apfel is. This is Sierra Vista's Iris. She's our Iris, and I just love her dearly. So, welcome, Andrea Marie. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's hard to live up to. No, you are like you truly. You are, you are our Iris. But why? I, I just mind. because you said I know. This. <laughs> what better would make me say that? You know this. <laughs> But that's true. That's true. I just, I just love it. Okay, so before we like before Andre Marie starts talking and sharing her story, I got to tell you all how we met. So, um, <laughs> I had gone to a women's group lunch went to the luncheon i didn't know anybody i didn't know what to expect i didn't i didn't know but everybody here is at least twice my age i recognize that immediately and i and i'm in there and i'm you know just kind of everybody's kind of mingling because you know people are getting there early and finding their seats and stuff and my hair probably looked like this mm -hmm. <laughs> and somebody walked up to me she came she made a beeline to me and she came over to me and she said i used to have a wig that looked just like your hair <laughs> and that i i just we just cracked up laughing that was the start mm -hmm. of our friendship it was destiny <laughs> and it, it, it was i i would i would agree with that good morning uh, I believe Monique has asked me here uh, to talk to you because it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month and I've had a bit of experience with that and I'm still picking bit. so that's why I'm here. Okay, you got <laughs> okay. a couple of thoughts. So tell us kind of what your, what is your, I'll, I'll say it like this so you can like really drop the hammer and tell story. What is your personal connection? What is your personal experience okay. with breast cancer? Well, my personal experience, first of all, I've had cancer four times. First time it was cervical cancer. The next three times it was breast cancer. And each time I had a different kind of tumor. Um, I, had I gave birth to twins in 1972. Within three days, I was given a mastectomy and breast surgery. I had to give them permission for a radical mastectomy in case because they wouldn't do any checking while I was pregnant. I woke up all bandaged, didn't know what they had done. My mother had come in from the airport. They wouldn't tell her anything. It was a very hysterical time. And uh, it was, in fact, a benign cyst. So I felt very fortunate. Mm -hmm. But it also put all the medical people on alert. And for the next 15 years, I was checked every three to six months because I had fibrocystic, I had fluid-filled tumors, I had all kinds of symptoms over and over and over. So I had all kinds of biopsies, surgical biopsies. Let's, you know, poke and look around and see and check. <laughs> and, and mammograms then were, you know, you think mammograms now are awful. Mammogram then was I was in a wheelchair because I just had the babies. And they took me into a room with a gigantic radiation thing on the ceiling, full size. Wow. And I had to somehow struggle to the edge of the table and get my babies over the edge of the table and hold it wow. until they could get the pictures. And it was like a really an excruciating and horrid experience. Wow. So uh, trust me, mammograms are better now. Um, but um, my, my experience with it has been mixed. It, it's been terrifying. It's been joyful. It's been sometimes, oh, no, not again. 
Uh, I wake up and say, well, I have today, uh, okay. Uh, but I also have learned not to be totally panic-stricken at that word. Mm -hmm. I hate that word, but I also fight that word, cancer, that we don't say out loud. Right, no. yeah, yeah, it is one of those, I have cancer. Yeah, really. Whisper it, we're afraid of it. No, 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 when I first found out I had breast cancer, first of all, they found it in July, I was 39. They didn't tell me until right before Christmas. I had just turned 40. So back then, in uh, 1986, I would not have had my first mammogram yet. And uh, so I went, and at that time I had to have a mastectomy and radiation. But when I found out I had it, I went straight back to work and said, I have breast cancer, and you need to go get your mammograms, and this is where you go, and this is what you do. And people were like, Oh, she talked about it out loud. Yeah, she talked yeah. about it out loud. I'm like, I'm going to keep talking about it out loud until you take care of yourself. And that's been my basic approach ever since. I mean, you definitely, um, you are a live out loud kind of person. Most of the time. <laughs> I don't say everything because I learned a long time ago that if I say absolutely everything, I get in huge trouble. You get trouble. in trouble? You get in <laughs> yeah. trouble? But I think that is so... Did, did breast cancer run in your family? Did you have... No. Wow. No. I have one sister who's had some trouble with it, uh, but I'm the older girl. But uh, no other cases that we know. Now, there's other cancers. I lost my father to cancer. I lost my brother to very sudden, horrible pancreatic cancer mm -hmm. right before he turned 58, which was really, really heartbreaking. Um, and, and I have one sister who's had some trouble with breast and other cancers, but not really. Uh, I don't know. Wow, just lucky I guess. <laughs> okay. um, so how do you, like you said, when you were diagnosed, you made it a point to tell people and talk about it. And I know that's how, I don't even remember the first time you told me your story, but I remember you saying it in a, listen, I've had cancer four times. Like you have always, in my experience, been very matter of fact, this is what has happened to me. Um, and the, just the fact that you are living boldly kind of shows people that, like you said, even though we have kept been conditioned to be afraid of that word, mm -hmm. you don't have to fear that word. You can still live after. You can still be all the things and, yeah. and, and, and reinvent yourself and do all of these amazing things after you've come out on the other side yeah. of that diagnosis. Not much of a calendar girl, but I don't really care. <laughs> Um, there is some fear, obviously, when you hear that word, you go, yeah. oh, and, and there's a, a time you have to just kind of think through what it might mean, and then you're terrified, and then you have to make some decisions, and you want to be ladylike about it, and you want to be grown up about it, and all that stuff, and all of a sudden, it occurred to me that I better approach it like a street fighter. And I did that too. I was very aggressive with my doctors, especially after the first time when they forgot to tell me for six or seven months. Uh, I was like, what are you gonna do? Why are you gonna do it? What are my options? You know. And I said, if they need, need to take them off, take them. I don't care, you know, I'd like to stay alive. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a battle we had for a while. Um, one of the things, oh, one of the things that occurred after my first lobectomy, they called it. Uh, I woke up that morning and the, the doctor came in and, how are you doing? And I said, well, I'm feeling okay, not great, you know. Yeah, well, I'll be back in a little while with the medical students and blah, blah, blah. So I'm sitting there with my arm like this, I couldn't move it, and I managed somehow to get my hair done and put on my makeup, and when those medical students came back, I didn't look like such a piece of trash. And the doctor's like, huh? What did you do? I said, well, I shampooed my hair and combed it. And, you know, I said, okay, you're crazy. You're just nuts. Okay. <laughs> uh, but that was the beginning of, you know, I'll be damned if I'm going to let this thing kill me. Yeah. I may not have ultimate control, but I do have influence over right. what it does to me and how it does it to me. And I didn't go home and sit in a corner and be sick and scared. I went back to work. I'd leave work and go do radiation, go back to work. And, uh, you know, it, it wasn't easy. And yes, you are afraid, but you get beyond that fear. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, everybody has to do something. Everybody has problems. I did not feel like a victim. Mm -hmm. I felt like, oh, wow, this is not what I planned, and I'd prefer to do it differently. But 
uh, this is what I got, and other people have diabetes, and they lose limbs, and they on and on and on and on, you know, and they have to live with it. And I thought, well, what? Instead of, some women ask me, well, didn't you get really angry? Like, why me? Why me? And I'm like, no. What would I do? Like, skip mine and give it to somebody else? <laughs> you know, that's a pretty hateful attitude. Yeah. So I didn't do it. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, I've had bad days. I've passed out. I've thrown up. I've been sick. I've been transfusions. I've had surgeries. I've had, you know, on and on and on. But I'm awake this morning. I'm here. I'm happy to be alive. And uh, I, I just want to encourage everybody, go get checked. Not knowing is a, the worst thing you can yes. do. Yes. Absolutely the worst thing you can do. Yes. Uh, you can't say humor is important. Oh, I had yeah. one dear friend in Phoenix who decided after my first mastectomy at age 50, let's see, that was 50, I was 57 then, after my first mastectomy that she would call me the Unabomber. <laughs> <laughs> she would just crack me up. She said, and then she said, we're going to have a new party game. No, she I said, didn't. what's that? She said, pin the boob on Andrea. It's kind of like pin the tail of the dog here. <laughs> and she, she was so good for me. I just love her. Just so good for me. Oh, wow. She would come kind of babysit me on Friday nights when my husband went to play music and I was too sick to be left mm -hmm. alone. So she'd come over and maybe microwave something or fix me a cup of tea. One time, I think we were able to go out and eat a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but she just, people like that, just inspire yeah. you and yeah. keep you going. Yeah. Because that's life, that's energy. Yeah. You said, okay, so you said a couple of things that I definitely want to, do you, that you know about the thing, that is... <laughs> That's hilarious. I love it. Um, you said a couple of things that I wanted to talk about. First, the fact that you you kind of had that mindset that okay, I am not going to go gently into the good night. Never, never, and, never. and 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 that came through even with how you interacted with your doctors. It made me think about um, uh, Serena Williams telling the story of how she had to push after she gave birth to her daughter. She had to push to get. A CAT scan. Uh -huh. She was telling the doctors, okay, I don't feel well, and they were ignoring her. Yes. She had to push to get the CAT scan, Absolutely. and when she did, mm -hmm. it showed the embolisms. She had numerous pulmonary embolisms yes. that if they had birth, she would have died. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's so, that's a lesson for all women in every situation. Mm -hmm. Like, we, we are almost conditioned to go along to get along. Uh -huh. and But sometimes bad. <laughs> you have to be a street fighter. Like sometimes you have to say, you know what? No. <laughs> no I've, I've had, in fact, one time, let's see, it was, a, I think, I don't remember which time it was. It gets all mixed up. But um, I was told I had it again on the second floor of a medical building in Phoenix, downtown. And um, I was told, well, you have to make an appointment with your doctor and uh, we'll get those form sent and it'll be a couple weeks and you know and I'm like my doctor's on the fourth floor it doesn't take two weeks to send this paper to the fourth floor mm -hmm. well it will take I said no it won't give me a copy I went in I knocked on the back door of his office and my primary care physician dear man was very patient with me most of the time he said I, you can't do this I have other patients I said I'm sorry but I have cancer again and last time they didn't tell me for six or seven months, and so I have to deal with it right now. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay, you'll have to wait till I see my other patients, and then I'll talk to you. But I went in his office that evening, sat down with him, got the surgeon across the street who had worked on my wow. primary care doctor's mother for cancer, and this was right before Christmas. We're talking the 18th, 19th of December, mm -hmm. and I would have been way out into January or February yes. getting surgery, and I knew it. And oh, that was the first time. And with the delay, I'm like, no, I can't do that. So uh, I, I was not very polite, and I wasn't very ladylike, and I interrupted him and irritated him. But you know what? I think it probably saved my life yeah. because that time the lymph nodes were right at the edge. And my surgeon told me, had we waited another week or two, that might have been the difference. Wow. So. You know, you just, you fight when you have to. That's right. That's and right. I ask them for a prophylactic, they think they call it now, mastectomy. And I was told, I was crazy, we don't do that. Uh, you know, no, no, there's nothing wrong with the other one. Well, there's something wrong with this one twice, so that's a pretty good indication of where <laughs> we're going here. <laughs> uh, and uh, they, they wouldn't do it. But at the time, uh, I had been smoking four packs a day for many years. Mm. And I'm like, well, 
Maybe if I'm talking about getting a double mastectomy for prophylactic purposes, I should perhaps quit smoking four packs of cigarettes mm -hmm. a day. So I have been a non-smoker since it, for decades. Um, you know. They finally did take the second one. But. And you had to push, you know, knowing your body, kind of knowing what you want, oh, oh. and and demanding it. And that's what we that's Crazy. what we have to do. Yeah, yeah we gotta be good. And, and screw being polite sometimes. Like, yeah. Well, besides being aggressive about your treatment and keeping your sense of humor and continuing to live as best you can, I think there's another piece. And oh, I've had a I had a brain aneurysm too about six years yeah, ago. And I had brain surgery. surgery. Mm -hmm. I thought my cancer had metastasized to my brain, wow. and that was a panicky time. And mm -hmm. I made them check, and they found this huge aneurysm. And so, uh, it's Meniere's disease, dizziness connected with hearing loss, no connection to cancer. Mm -hmm. and, but but anyway, um, it was scary. You know, thinking it had moved there. Um, but another another thing I'd like to address is not just the medical beat it side. There's another psychological mm -hmm. being a woman, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. If it's okay, I'd like to talk about that. Yeah, a bit. yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, I obviously walk around with no prosthesis on. They're at home in the drawer. I have a lovely pair. Um, I wore them th after the first mastectomy. I wore a prosthesis because I taught high school students. Mm -hmm. 15 year olds at 8 o'clock in the morning yeah. and I'm like in Phoenix and I'm like I'm not giving this this to talk about every day at 8 o'clock yeah. in the morning I just don't want to hear it so yeah. I wore the prosthesis and went on about my business when the second one came off at first I'm thinking oh reconstruction a boob job and a free tummy tuck what's not to like you know woo because by then I was like 63 years old mm -hmm. and I'm thinking well it's time to get all this stuff fixed anyway you know <laughs> And I started checking into that, and the more I found out about it, the more I found out I really don't want to do that. Yeah. My husband begged me not to have more surgery. He was just an absolute prince about getting me through it twice. Yeah. And I didn't wear my prosthesis after that. I haven't had them all, and I'm going to be 72 this month, but I haven't worn them since before that last time with cancer. And I don't plan to wear them anymore. I just, I could run down Main Street without a shirt and be legal. I could, you know, uh, I've been in fashion shows. I dress up all the time. But I don't, I've never had anybody walk up to me and say, oh my God, your breasts are missing. <laughs> so if they, if they do they notice, do. they don't have that the nerve to say anything. And I just don't care. I'm not self-conscious about it. I don't feel unfeminine. Yeah. Um, I did do a drawing after the first mastectomy that I called half. And it was a very like almost abstract, angular, geometric -y kind of thing that was dark and terrible. So I know that emotion was there, mm -hmm. but I got it out and faced it and dealt mm -hmm. with it. And I don't feel like less a woman. I don't feel like unfeminine. Mm -hmm. um, part of that is having a life partner, Ray, who is loving and loyal mm -hmm. and generous and uh, could care less because he loves the inside me. Right. Uh, part of that is just being a stubborn person all my life. Uh, but you have to work on I've sat through chemo with other friends mm -hmm. who I have lost. Uh, but you have to you have to work on, okay, get a wig you like. Yeah. Uh, wear an earring that you think is pretty. Go pick a flower from outside. Take a minute to have a cup of tea with a friend if you can get the tea down. You know, yeah. you do those things because if you don't stay connected with life and with yourself, your own inner life, then it it can become a, a trip down a big black hole. Yeah, yeah. And then you end up dying before you're dead. Absolutely. And I know I know many people who've done that, unfortunately. And I absolutely refuse. I'm gonna go out of here kicking and screaming. <laughs> okay. I love that you you know you mentioned your choice, your conscious choice to not wear prosthesis. And the fact that nobody brings it up is because you live, your your existence shows that it hasn't affected you. You know what I'm saying? It would be one thing if you walked around, uh -huh. you know, oh, no. if you went into every place just oh, like, no, oh no. no, but that's not who you are. No. You own it. Absolutely. You, you know, you're like, okay, well, I mean, I'm not missing my boobs, so why are y'all missing them? You yeah. know, <laughs> what is the... In fact, I wear a lot of necklaces, so, uh, you know, if you're glancing there, you at least have something to look at. I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's calling more attention to it or, or camouflaging it, or I don't really quite but know that's, But I think that's how, just like there. you were saying, how you, tell, how you tell your friends, you know, find an earring, find a wig, like it's yeah. you 
recognizing, okay, I don't have boobs. Am, I mean, is, is that going to let me, is that going to cause me to stop living? Or am I going to find another way to still express mm -hmm. the unique person that I am mm -hmm. and do that? That's important. And I'm old enough, you know, like I said, I'll be 72 in a couple of weeks. And I'm old enough that when I came along, your breasts were like the, the sell all and do mm -hmm. all of femininity. That was a big deal. We all sat around trying to make it look bigger and stuffed our bras with Kleenex for the junior high dances. And, you know, we did all that stuff because that was such a thing. So I had that whole cultural mystique yeah. to overcome. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, if someone talks to me, oh, don't you feel odd? Or, no. It's not like they cut off my nose or something. Exactly. You know, it's like, I'm really okay with it. I'm just very happy to be alive. And if I get it, you know, if I get it again, and I had I had a uh, meeting with my oncologist mm -hmm. this week, checking for tumor markers every six months yeah. of my life, and things look good. And he said, stay active. Good. And I said, well, I'm trying, you know, I'm dancing and I'm going to meetings. Doing and, all you know, kinds of stuff. He said, well, that's the good stuff. Okay, yeah. so, yeah. and if I get cancer again, I will do whatever I need to do to fight it. And, you know, someday it may get me, but it's not gonna be without a fight. I know that's right. That's, that's why I love you so much because you are just like, listen, whatever it is, you you recognize, okay, life is going to happen and I have to choose how I'm going to respond to the life. Absolutely. To, to what, like, and I'm just not going to let it, like, take me out. Well, and that, ex that extends to everything. Right. You know, right. My, my daughters, I have, I had two daughters, um, and I told him, you will get mammograms well before you're 40. Mm -hmm. You will keep up with that. And they got to where they had to call me and tell me it was scheduled and so forth. I actually lost my older daughter in May of this year, mm -hmm. very suddenly, nine days before her 46th birthday. Yeah. And that has been the, the worst, most horrible thing I've ever had to deal with. And yet, I still wake up in the morning, and I miss her, and I mourn her. But I still wake up in the morning, and like, I'm alive. I have this day. I have other people who are important to me, that I love, that I need to help. Uh, I have other things I can do that are of use to the community. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, you, you know, you, you have that sadness, but you also have, if you work on it, a real will to live and yeah. keep giving. Yeah. And I just think that's whatever it is in your life is yeah. what you have to do. Amen. Amen to that. See, y'all see why she had to, <laughs> we had to do this? Because she is just, I mean, we could sit and talk uh, for a thousand years, yeah, a thousand, <laughs> literally a thousand years. Absolutely. Um, but I just, I just love you. I just, I'm just so grateful to be able to chat with you and introduce the people uh -huh. to you. And yes, her birthday is coming up. Are you doing a party this year? I haven't. October 29th. Yes, I'm doing my party. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So sure. So, my celebration of life. Celebration that of I life. I do every year. <laughs> Andre Marie. Okay, listen. I know if those of you that are watching that are, you know, the young people you think you can party. This woman. <laughs> Her annual celebration of life for her birthday, October 29th, uh -huh. she will be 72 this year. Um, her parties are off the chain. <laughs> I'm not going to have it on the 29th. I have to have it on right, the day because the band gonna... picks the day. So, you know. okay, we're talking about a band. When, okay, so when your husband is a rock star, you could have a band, you know, the band play at your birthday birthday. 